Anybody feel that way? <laughs> but I feel like you're here and <laughs> you, you can't get in where all the good guys are, all the fun people are. All the things you know ought to be done by you, but you can't figure out how to get in there and do them. And I, I asked Kenneth to sing this. I made, no, it had to be after uh, the sabbatical started because we saw Dear Evan Hansen a few weeks ago and I, I thought, oh, it's a great song and Kenneth will do it beautifully. And he did, and I'm grateful. So, let's, where do I start? Let's start at the beginning of the sabbatical. I'm going to, in the upcoming weeks, we'll get through more. In this afternoon's town meeting, we'll get through more. But I'll start with where we started on the sabbatical, which was Vipassana. Ten days of silence. And I heard a voice last January that said, Sean, you're going on sabbatical in September. You need to start with the silence. You need to start by grounding and uh, enhancing your spirituality. And so what, what, I finished on Sunday and then Wednesday, driving to Massachusetts, Shelburne Falls, uh, to begin this event. Uh, and I had to laugh because uh, you notice I just hopping right up on the stage. I'm, I'm, my knees are pretty in pretty good shape these days. But at that point, they st still haven't healed completely. and. And, and hadn't healed as much as they have now. And yet I celebrate, I gotta tell you, since I fell in, was it June? I celebrate every week that I walk better than I did before. I celebrate my hand that it's better than it was. And my mind is better than it was. So I get that, and I let them know in advance, I'm gonna need a chair to sit on, I can't do the floor. I did try though, they gave me a pallet, and I got down on the floor twice. It was getting up off the floor that was <laughs> an issue. And uh, uh, what I found is my knees hurt all day long when I did that. So I, I sat and I decided to be nice to yourself, be kind to yourself, Sean. You, you are allowed to sit in a chair. You don't have to be the big boy who sits on the floor. I didn't have to test myself that way. But I remember the first night, and I, I had had this done for me when I first did it, which was, this was my fourth time. Some man I talked to, I forget how many times he had done the 10-day course. And I knew for the entire time I was in the silence that that man was there and he was on my side and willing that I complete uh, the course. He never spoke to me, you know, he didn't, we didn't have happy looks or anything, there was none of that. I just knew, I just knew that there's one person here. So what I've done every single time is I try to go to at least one person, newcomer. And this particular one at the dinner they served, the beginning, and I use the term loosely, they, uh, I sat with three guys and it was their first time. And I said, guys, I wanna let you know, I'm here, I'm willing, I will never look at you, I will, we will not lock eyes, we, I, but I'm willing that you get through this successfully, no matter what. So if you ever look over at me, you can just know, Sean's willing. And they thanked me. And I would see them, oh, some days they'd just be in hell. You could tell by the way they walk. One guy walked like he had somewhere to get to on that tiny <laughs> circle going around. Uh, and I used to do that. People commented about, Sean, you walk, what is it with you? And this is after the fact when they said, you walked around here like, and, and I realized when I looked at this guy, he's walking like he's got some place to get to and it's, he's walking in a circle because there's so much energy, there's so much you can't express. It was my fourth time, it was easier. But, and another guy at the end, he came to me in tears and he said, Sean, at day five, did you look at me and smile? Because I needed it so much that day and I don't think I would have made it if it hadn't been for your smile. I don't know if I did or not, but he made it through. Now, during Vipassana, there were things I came to understand because you can't read, write, but you can't pray. You are asked not to pray while you're here. You are asked to do Vipassana. You're asked to do a very specific type of meditation, period. And our Christian prayers get in the way. Our journaling, our music, everything, they get in the way of that. And the purpose of Vipassana is to eradicate craving, aversion, and ignorance. And 
once you're an old student, and it has nothing to do with age, it means you've done it once before. <laughs> you've taken the course, a 10-day course. Your old students get a, what is called a cell, which is a little room in the pagoda behind the big med meditation hall. And I got mine, I think the third day, and I was in there, and I was sitting, and I was thinking about my knees, I was thinking about healing, and I thought, well, I've had an instantaneous healing before. What's going on that I haven't had it yet on this one? And it occurred to me that within every faith, there has to be room for healing, for an instantaneous healing. Within every faith, there has to be room for that. And I was so relieved to realize that. And so I, I, uh, I made my knees less special because part of Vipassana is observe, observation, observing every sensation, every sensation. And through the course, I began to get really get that. I could start to feel my t-shirt on my skin, things I take for granted all the time. I could, I could actually feel the collar. I could feel the sleeves. I could just feel the weight of the cotton right here. I could feel waistband. I, I, could, I could feel the floor pushing on my feet. Now, I had always thought it was the other way around, that your feet push on the floor, but I could feel if I'm just sitting here, I could feel the floor pushing on my feet. I, I, I could observe. And so my knees had no more specialness than any other sensation. And with that, my thoughts didn't create more ailment, more pain, more anything. And so then I could begin to observe where my thoughts created disturbances in the body. I, I could observe all this. And, and it's, uh, but none of them had specialness. None of them had any guilt to go with them. There were nothing that said, oh, don't think this, do think this. There was none of that. There was B, 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 head to toe, toe to head, over and over and over again. And then I observed how much I use God superstitiously. I use the word God to get things, to try to get something, to try to get something that I already have. So I had created an idol, a false idol, out of God to where God meant nothing to me anymore but a means of acquisition or of trying to get a feeling or get rid of a feeling. And isn't that what most of our acquisition is? Is to create a feeling or to try to get rid of one. I don't want to feel this. But when all feelings become equanimous, as, as Mr. Goenka says, equanimous, equanimous, I heard that word so many times. And, and I, then they don't have their meaning or their charge that they used to have. And so my word says, I barely use the word God since September. My word has become love because love has no personality to it. So with love, I'm not trying to get something. I'm seeking to reveal it with the word love. And I noticed when I was driving up to Shelburne Falls, I was anxious in the drive, and I, just, and I suddenly said, love precedes me on my path. And the next thing that came out of my thoughts was, well, love is my path. Love is my car. Love is this body. Love is all the drivers driving on this road. And so ever since then, I have not been seeking God for anything. I've been, I, and I haven't been seeking love. I have been using it. I have been using the love that is. And there are days, and well, at least moments, that I forget. Imagine. Anybody ever forgotten love exists? <laughs> Anybody? This morning, yesterday, the day before, last night, uh, 10 minutes from now, you're already planning for where <laughs> love is going to be absent. And so... Lots of disturbing thoughts have come up in my mind during sabbatical, and I've had to make many apologies. I have reacted on those thoughts, both within the church and home, different places, 
and I've taken 10 minutes to an hour to rethink them. And then I make a phone call and say, sorry about that. Sorry, I was upset about something I had no need to be upset about. Sorry about that. I apologize. I didn't need to be guilty because what use is guilt? That will not force me into love. Guilt is not redemption. Love is. Truth is, wisdom is redemption. If you want to be free from that which you no longer desire, or free from which is that which is not your heart's desire, is a better way to put it. And I have witnessed many, many around me creating idols of so many things, false gods. And what I realized is how confused we are in our worshiping. Most of us would not think we worship our foibles. Most of us would not realize that we worship our debt. We worship our guilt. We worship money. We think money is the source of money. We think people are the source of our misery. We are so confused about that, and I get it, because I have been too. But they have become our God. They are what we pray to. They're the very thing we pray to, to get away from. You know, we pray to money to give us more money so that we won't be afraid of money anymore. And all we get is more fear of money. We pray to our sickness to get rid of sickness, and what we get is more sickness. We think we're praying to God, but what does that mean? There is no to God. I was taught when first, when I first walked into unity, you pray from a God consciousness. You do not pray to God. There is no God to pray to. At unity, we don't have a Christian God. And I'm not here to criticize a Christian God. The Christian's fine. Let, let the Christians do what they want to do. We're not Christian even though we follow the Christ teachings. It's very confusing. It's very confusing. I'm going to spit here. We do not, how Christian of me. Uh, <laughs> but we do not. Unity is not Christian. Jesus is our master teacher. One minister I put it, and I really like how he said, we're more Christist than we are Christian. We do not have a human God with a personality. We just don't have that here. And I know many of us have brought it through the door week after week after week. And we will scream and rant and raid, ra ra rant and rave. rave, that's the word I'm looking for, <laughs> to the skies, to the smoke, to the whatever. Get rid of this, take this from me but I'm not willing to give it away. And that's where you and I are responsible. All that you want removed from you, lifted from you, are you willing to give it away freely? Because everything you don't want, trust me, it's temporary. And it could so easily be let go of. Anybody who has let go of addiction, substances, you know, you can let this go. You may not let go of your obsession with it. You may think about it the rest of your life. But the problem is with so many recovering addicts and everything, they're still taking the guilt with them. They are promised no regrets in the 12 steps and they carry regret with them the rest of their life. If only I hadn't done those awful things, I could be happy. But, that's, but you are promised no regrets. So go ahead and be happy. Go ahead. Your life is great now. Maybe because you're an alcoholic. Maybe because you're an addict. Maybe because you smoke cigarettes. Maybe because you were abused as a child. You can help so many so you have reasons to be grateful rather than making idols of abuse, idols of alcohol, idols of sobriety, idols of all these things. I'm going to read Charles Fillmore and The Revealing Word wrote this. Idol. In scriptural language, a false god. Even as Jesus was tempted by Satan. And are you aware Jesus was tempted by Satan in the scriptures? Are you aware of that? 
Now, Satan, what is that except our minds that tell us to put God aside? That's all that Satan is. It's not a person. It's not a personality except your own. We are often tempted to worship the false gods of greed, covetousness, jealousy, retaliation, and other forms of negation. We are often tempted. It's like when Jesus, you know, he was coming into his power there, coming into his power. And the mind says, oh, I can transform the physical into other things, turn these rocks into food, or look how great I'll be, I'll feed everybody, I'll take care of it. It's kind of like praying to win the lottery so you could take care of your family, but you're not praying to, to, to win the lottery for your family to win the lottery so they can take care of you. Am I right? How many fantasize, oh, if I just won the lottery, I would take care of everybody, I would give so much. But who's praying, I wish they'd win the lottery so they would take care of me? Oh, no, I, 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 I wanna control this. Anyway, and my favorite though, Jesus, the mind takes Jesus up on the mount and says, or no, it's up, is it up on the mountain? It's up on the church, church, top of the church. Jump from here and land and show everybody how powerful you are, like the amazing Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus says, get thee behind me. I'm not here to make the world special. I'm here to show us a new way to think. I'm here to show us a way into the kingdom, which is to forgive everyone. It's like, oh man, I don't want that. And please, please, you know, let me jump from the building and land. <laughs> don't make me have to forgive everybody. I, w I went home to my hometown one week uh, during the sabbatical, and I found my last stepfather's grave in a cemetery where he's buried. I've not seen him, so, well, 90, 1997, I saw him for 10 minutes, if even if that, on his front porch to give him something after my mother died. But he plays a lot in my mind. He made it into my club act. I, I mean, it's a, and it was all about regret. And I learned, I pick and choose my regrets. You know, I let my mother off the hook for the abuse as a child, but I never let him off the hook. I pick and choose my regrets. I pick and choose my resentments. I pick and choose. Oh, this one, it's safe now to let off, but not this one. How are they different? How are they different? How is one more worthy of regret than another? So I went to his grave. I let him off the hook. I said, if it's okay that mother did that to help me get here, then it has to be okay that you did what you did to get here, and I release you if my power of release has, can help you, can help you to go to the next plane, can help you, I gratefully and willingly set us both free. And then I left, because what more am I gonna do? I'm at a graveside. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna stand and wait and see what happens. I, I can get a revelation on my way to the mall. I don't need to have uh, to, to stand in, a, in an old graveyard. So. I picked up this, imagine, I reached for the Bible now. I'm going to read a Bible story, because we have time. <laughs> huh? And it comes from the book of Daniel. I'm actually going to the Old Testament here. Daniel 3 says, King Nebuchadnezzar, did I pronounce that right, John? Yes. yes. Oh, how nice. Made a <laughs> John knows these things. <laughs> King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet high and nine feet wide and set it up. And then he sent messages to all the princes, governors, captains, judges, treasurers, counselors, sheriffs, and rulers of all the provinces of his empire to come to the dedication of his statue. When they had all arrived and were standing before the monument, a herald shouted, O oh, people of all nations and languages, this is the king's command. When the band strikes up, you're to fall flat on the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will, will, will immediately be thrown into a flaming furnace. <laughs> so when the band began to play, <laughs> whatever his nation, they all fell to the ground and worshiped the statue. But some officials went to the king and accused some of the, some of the people, the Jews, of refusing to worship. Your Majesty, you made a law that everyone must fall down and worship the gold statue when the band begins to play. 
and that anyone who refuses will be thrown into a flaming furnace. But there are some out there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of Babylonian affairs. They have defied you, refusing to serve your gods or to worship the gold statue you set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a terrible rage, ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought in before him. Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you are refusing to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I'll give you one more chance. When the music plays, if you will fall down and worship the statue, all will be well. But if you refuse, you will be thrown into a flaming furnace within the hour. And what God can deliver you out of my hands then? Well, the three guys replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not worried about what will happen to us. If we are thrown into the flaming furnace, our God is able to deliver us, and he will deliver us out of your hand. But if he doesn't, please understand that even then we will never, under any circumstance, serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have erected. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and his face became dark, and he commanded that the furnace be heated up seven times hotter than usual, and called for some of the strongest men of his army to bind the three men and throw them into the fire. So they bound them tight with ropes and threw them into the furnace fully closed. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames leapt out and killed the soldiers as they threw them in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell down bound into the roaring flames. But suddenly as he was watching, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and, explained to his, and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we throw three men into the furnace? Yes. Well, look, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire, and they aren't even hurt. And the fourth looks like a god. Then he came as close as he could to the open door, the flaming furnace, and yelled, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego! Servants of the Most High God, come out! Come out here! <laughs> come out! So they stepped out of the fire. <laughs> then the princes... And they all gathered the governors. Everybody gathered around. Not a hair on their heads was singed. Their coats were unscorched, and they didn't even smell of smoke. So Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, for he sent his angel to deliver his trusting servants when they defied the king's commandment and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make this decree that any person of any nation, language, or religion who speaks a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn from limb to limb <laughs> and his house knocked into a heap of rubble. For no other God can do as this one does. Then, they, then the king gave promotions to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego so that they prospered greatly. So... So, Bible's crazy. <laughs> so what the king said was, if you don't worship what I say you ought to worship, you can go to hell. That's what he said to them, because isn't that what hell's supposed to be? The fiery furnace. You can go to hell. That's what we've been threatened our whole life, many of us. You can go to hell if you don't do. You're going to hell if you don't do what we say. If you don't worship the way we worship, you can go to hell. You're going to burn forever. Many churches, many businesses, many places, they worship. They don't, they have a mission statement and they don't listen to it. They don't pay attention to it because priorities take place. The realities of the earth. I, one of my favorite things I've ever heard from people, and I've heard it from a lot of people over the years, is Sean this is all very nice, but out there in the real world, and I say, no, this is the real world. That's the temporary one. This is the real world. Spirit must prevail. Spirit must prevail in our choices and the way we see things. The God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is love. And if I worship 
in love, I can't come to any true harm. Maybe my body will be destroyed, but my spirit never will. And I can be at peace with whatever is going on. But if I begin to create false gods out of this floor, this ceiling, out of my relationship, out of our home, out of even our cats, which are worthy, they are little gods. Uh, <laughs> if I create false idols out of you guys, if I create an idol out of what you choose to give to the church or what you choose not to give to the church, I'm not at peace. I'm not in joy. And I have abandoned the reality of love. If I create an idol out of what I think you think of me, because you see, it's never what you think of me. It's only what I think you think, or they think, or anyone thinks. Let us put down our superstitions. Let us put our thoughts of the world and its stuff as a reality. Let us put down our criticisms as something that is powerful. And let us begin to listen. I listened at every moment during my, my sabbatical. I listened for the next right thing to think. Before I left on sabbatical, for months, before I left, I had no idea what I was going to do for three months. Years ago when I took my sabbatical, I knew I'm going to Florida, I'm going here, I'm going to do this. When I left for Vipassana, I did not know what the remaining two and a half months of my sabbatical was going to be. And when, during the time of my sabbatical, it came out that I was going on a cruise ship and make my comedy debut. It turned out I was going home to see my family to do forgiveness. And it turned out we were going to go to Mexico, um, and I'll tell more about that another time, to visit with friends and see a, a, a city, a really foreign city that I'd never been to before. I didn't know that David and I were going to get along so beautifully. And that doesn't mean we always agreed. And it doesn't mean that we saw eye to eye or always understood but we were present. We were present for one another. And at no time did I wish I weren't with David in that time. And I'm pretty clear he didn't wish he weren't with me, unless he's lying to me. <laughs> now, if he is, he'll go to the fiery furnace. <laughs> <laughs> what I ask of all of us is to pay attention, to listen. There is a voice within every single one of us. And it's telling you that you are loved and you are worthy of all that the kingdom has to offer. Every one of us. And so, just because you have an opinion doesn't mean you're right. Are we clear on that? Just because you are convinced that you ought to be afraid or that you have to make a choice right now doesn't make you right. It just means you feel strongly about it. Before we act on our thoughts and our opinions and our fears and our hurts, listen. Go within and listen. I'm going to sing a song that David wrote. And I closed my second show with this for a long time, but it seemed appropriate. I sang it in Ajijic, Mexico. A-J-I-J-I-C <laughs> is how it's spelled, but that's the town we were in. I was invited to sing at the Unitarian Universalist Church two weeks ago today. And at the party the night before, I sang this song. I sang Borrowed Time at the church. But it seemed right on my first Sunday back to get to sing this, so let me wet the gift here. <laughs> And let's hit it. <laughs> There's a voice that's softly whispering inside my head Telling me I'm gonna be alright 
It keeps saying, let yourself be led where you are led. Don't hold back, don't put up a fight. It tells me, trust the wind, breathe the air. There's a place you're meant to be, and you're already there. Open up your heart and let life in. You know that you can always trust the wind. When the world starts doing things that I don't understand And I search my soul to find a reason why In the dark of night I feel somebody take my hand And tell me you don't even have to try It tells me trust the wind, breathe the air Know that there are helping hands around you everywhere Open up your heart and let life in You know that you can always trust the wind Dreams have wings Thoughts take flight All good things are happening for us every day They hear our prayers, they know the way I'm gonna trust the wind, breathe the air And know that there are helping hands around me everywhere I'll open up my heart and let life in you know, wherever breezes blow, wherever winding rivers flow, I'm going where I need to go. I can trust the wind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I said to David, was I all over the place pitch-wise? Because from the inside, it felt that way. And you're, so you see, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know.